this afternoon. I'm Brent Bambury. John Ronson is with us. John is a documentary maker. He's a journalist, a columnist. He's a writer. He has uh, been an early adapter of podcasting and social media, and he's the author of uh, a number of books, including Them, The Men Who Stare at Goats, a great collection of essays, Lost at Sea, which we could spend the entire day talking about because of the, the vast uh, breadth of, of, of experiences that are represented there, The Psychopath Test, and also his latest book, which is called So You've Been Publicly Shamed. Perhaps you've heard a little bit about that. John, obviously, John's a very accomplished person, but all of these accomplishments are meager when you compare them to the fact that he played keyboards for Frank Sidebottom. <laughs> yeah. Please welcome John Ronson, ladies and gentlemen. Hi. Oh. Thank you. And co-wrote a film called Frank. Ba I don't know if anybody saw it. Based on those times, Frank wore a big fake head that he never took off. And nothing makes a young man feel more alive and on an adventure than speeding up a motorway at two o'clock in the morning, sitting next to a man wearing a big fake head. <laughs> Why not be the man in the big fake head? Did that ever appeal to you? No. Uh, no, at, at, at that age, um, just, you know, to be plucked out of, you know, Cardiff, suburbia, and, you know, to get to join this band, um, that was that was as you know that was as high an ambition as I could possibly imagine. It's funny. I remember one time, like we would play to like audiences of like you know seventy five people, maybe a hundred people at music venues up and down Britain. And then I remember like he got there was like this kind of sense of growing discontent in the van because like he was thinking why you know why can't we be famous you know why can't we be really big? And it struck me, God, this is what this isn't enough. Like I I thought this was enough. But um, then he did become very big. I mean, Frank Sidebottom was quite of a quite a huge yeah. creation for a while. Well, he never got that big. Um, he supported Bross at Wembley. <laughs> that was fifty thousand people. Um, yeah, we, and that was his opportunity to like break into the mainstream. Um, but he instead, what he chose to do was play really bad Bross cover versions <laughs> for about five minutes, then got bottled off stage, uh, and he took his head off and said, uh, "Best gig we ever did." <laughs> <laughs> um, and then he d when he died, he died penniless, That's and right. yeah, was going to be buried in a pauper's grave. Mm -hmm. um, and so we sent out, I sent out one tweet saying, you know, for a few thousand pounds, he could be spared a pauper's burial. Mm. Um, within a day on Twitter, we'd raised twenty-one thousand pounds, which see was see how good and powerful social media is. Ex right? Yeah, I mean, that was yeah, exactly. That was enough to to bury and exhume him and rebury and exhume him <laughs> half a dozen times. No, exactly. The, although what I would say about that is, yeah, I mean, that was amazing. And like, and I, like everybody, I, I, I love it when things like that happen. Mm. And, but in a weird sort of way, it's kind of part of the problem too, because, mm. because what we do on social media is we're like this wildly swinging pendulum where everybody's either, you know, a magnificent hero or a sickening villain. So for every wonderful deed we do, like rescue that pit bull recently from, you know, nobody would would, would uh, adopt the pit bull. And so the pit bull held up a sign that said, why will nobody adopt me? Everybody at the shelter says I'm a good boy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so we all, you know, including me, burst into tears. And But then for every, so every time we do something amazing like that, it's like, you know, because we've created a stage for like these high dramas, these artificial high dramas, when when somebody transgresses, we treat them as evil, as the wonderful dog oh. is wonderful. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. So, so you're either Marnie or you're Justine Sacco. And it's like, never, you know, there seems to be not much in between the two. When you were writing The Psychopath Test, mm -hmm. you were afraid that you yourself might be a psychopath. When you were writing this book, Mm -hmm. A different kind of fear took you. What was that? Well, fear? this one came true that I'd be publicly shamed, and that's what it seemed to happen. I was never that worried about becoming a psychopath, and in fact, somebody told me quite early on, like if you're worried that you might be a psychopath, that means you're not one, because <laughs> psychopaths never worry about it. Because what's there to worry about? It's like you know, there's no guilt, there's no remorse, there's no anxiety. You know, all these kind of things that keep us moral are all painful things. Um, 
Yeah, which is why, you know, it's probably the most pleasant feeling of all the mental disorders. But, um, in but I, although I did, uh, although I did notice that, you know, I would sometimes adopt psychopathic characteristics to get interviews. Like and that worked. I mean, the, the, mm. you, you say that, that in, in fact, having no empathy is probably a good thing in the business world because then you 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 achieve yeah. and you can crush your enemies and you know, what if, if you have no shame like in in this book we meet a couple of people max mosley is one of them mm -hmm. mike daisy i would say is kind of another who seem to not be able to be shamed it maybe that is an advantage in the world of social social media to not have that ability to be shamed yeah although the thing about about max mosley i would say max mosley was a he, he was um his father was a fascist leader in Britain and he got involved in a, um, uh, he got secretly filmed at what the News of the World called a sick Nazi orgy. Oh. And Max's point was that, you know, where the orgy was, um, was German tinged, but it wasn't Nazi themed. Mm -hmm. uh, well, so, he should know. Go, yeah, he said, he said in court, like yeah. if I wanted to, you know, get a Nazi uniform, it's very easy to find one, a costumier. Um, <laughs> and um, so he won the court case and, and survived completely. But I think really, the th what really saved Max Mosley, um, it wasn't just that he felt no shame because he didn't feel that he'd done anything wrong. Mm. And rightly so, I don't think Max had done anything wrong either. Um, but that we, we, we didn't care. He was a man in a sex scandal. Mm -hmm. If you're going to be in a scandal, be a man in a sex scandal because nobody cares. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Because we hold the power now. Or when I say we, I mean, I suppose, you know, social justice people mm -hmm. on social media. We don't care about that so much. You know, what we care about is people who misuse their privilege. Um, you know, that is what... That's what destroys now. Well, let's talk about Jonah Lehrer, because Jonah Lehrer is a journalist and somebody who I think a lot of journalists believe did misuse his privilege. Mm. And he warned you that spending time with him would ruin you. Yeah. He said that he was radioactive. And you just said that you've been publicly shamed. So yeah. is there a chance he was right? Um, well, only one person tried to get me on the Jonah Lehrer thing, and that was a Slate uh, article that basically said, but it was it was it was not true. Uh, the Slate article basically said that I was treating Joan Alera's transgressions as unseriously as Justine Sacco's transgressions. So his entire piece was based on that, mm -hmm. but it just wasn't true. I mean, anybody who's read the book knows that I I treat Joan Alera in a completely different category. Um, and in fact, if anything, Joan Alera is like a kind of overture to the book where. Um, um, what what's what's interesting is that for thirty years I, I've been you know humanizing demonized people the clan you know islamic militants religious cult leaders jonathan king jonathan K K well I, he didn't i didn't humanize him that much um but but yeah i mean i've been you know that's what i do my whole time um but with jonah lara it's like how dare you humanize him you know don't mm -hmm. you can't humanize him you know i think i really I think it's really clear what I did with Joan Alera, which was that I humanised him without exonerating him. And I, I can't, honestly, for the life of me, unless I've, I've just lost my mind, I don't see what's wrong with that. But you say to him at one point, what happened to you is my worst nightmare. Yeah. So, so w w I mean, not being afraid, not the fact that you might be socially shamed for what you wrote about him, just the fact that you were with him and that you were trying to humanise him, did that, did, did that frighten you? Or did, that, did you think that there was a risk in that? This, right in this whole book frightened me. Yeah. I, I was with people who, you know, on social media, we do to people the thing that we are most terrified would be done to us. You know, shamed, you know, defined by transgression, shamed, cast out into the wilderness. This is agony. You know, these are agonizing things. Everybody I talked to for this book, you know, would talk about their suicidal thoughts, would talk about uh, anxiety, depression, insomnia. You know, one person I met didn't leave, the ho didn't leave her house for nothing. I mean, a joke that landed badly. Didn't leave home for a year and a half. Um, you know, we were doing to people that this, this appalling thing that we are terrified would most happened to us there was this really irresponsible review of the book a week ago which basically said um it was in the new york times it basically said basically said ah you know what it's just words you know there's nothing Every, you're fine everyone's fine public shaming you know you're fine uh, but you know i did something that people haven't done which is go around the world meeting these people and you know believe me you know it, they're not fine and did you expect the kind of pushback that you're getting as a result of that i mean you did you think yeah. that people would take you to task because you're seen to be humanizing people who some think were justifiably shamed? You know, it had never happened to me before. Um, people always got it before in my other books. You know, in the psychopath test, I humanize psychopaths. 
uh, in them, you know, I humanize neo-Nazis. It's like, so it did take me a little bit by surprise. It's like, you know, when you, s I suppose when you say, look at those crazy people over there, let's examine abuses of power committed by crazy people over there. That's really easy. Mm. We can all agree that those crazy people over there who are abusing their power, you know, that's fine. We can talk about that. But as soon as you say, you know what, the crazy people who are abusing their power, they're us now. Mm. You know, you get pushed back. Mm -hmm. They say, well, maybe you're a racist too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and so I thought maybe I'd get a bit of it, but I certainly had more than I thought I, I would have. But the thing is, like, you know, this book doesn't actually do anything wrong. You know, this this book, um, the book's been criticised um, for not pointing out gender imbalances that women get shamed worse than men. But this book constantly points that out. So I can only, you know, f throughout the book, I point that out, that women get it much worse than men. So I can only assume that I am, like many before me, a blank canvas for other people to put their ideology onto. This is what BuzzFeed said about the book in the headline. John Ronson is getting publicly shamed over a line cut from his book. Yeah. So this is, you know, you're being shamed for saying that's not in the book. Do you want me to tell that story? Yeah, I mean, people saw that, this, 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 people took this out of context, obviously, Yeah. And, and on Twitter. And but but tell the story. Set it up for us if you would. Okay, so there was a um, a, a woman, a troll called Mercedes Hafer, and mm. I asked her why. And this is all in the book. This I, is in the book. Yeah, I asked her why so many shamings are so breathtakingly misogynistic, mm -hmm. and she said um, because we think of like the worst thing we can do to somebody and then call for that thing to happen. The worst thing we can think to do to a man in our culture is get them fired because when they're fired, they're robbed of their masculinity points. Um, and the worst thing we can think to do to a woman is is rape. So we call for women to be raped and we call for men to be fired because it's about plausible fears. That was mm -hmm. her point. Mm -hmm. So I put all of that in the book and it's all in the book. But then there was a line which I wrote after that in the book, which I was basically channeling that Margaret Atwood um, line men are afraid that women will laugh at them and women are afraid that men will kill them. So I, you know, there was a line where I basically said something like, you know, as a man, I can't think of anything worse than being fired. I, I so don't know if she was right, but I do know this. I can't think of many worse things than getting fired. That's yeah. the line that was cut. So I just kind of put that line in the book and, w and it was in the galley of the book. Um, and I was out hiking with uh, Starly Kine and uh, Tim Minchin and the conversation got onto that line. And Starley said, you know, there's, there's a line in your book that's, you know, I think people might misconstrue. And I said, which line? She said, that one. And I thought, oh, don't be ridiculous. Nobody could misconstrue that. And she said, no, really, I think so. And I said to Tim, you know, do you think so? And he said, yeah, I think people could misconstrue that line. And I was like, fuck. Um, and then I got back to New York. And about a week later, I got an email from somebody who'd read the galley and said, you think there's a line in that book that could get you publicly shamed and I'm like really I don't know surely nobody would would think that I'm saying that being fired is as bad as being raped I'm talking you know I'm, I'm, it's just my way of that of saying that Margaret Atwood line but I thought, okay well three people have said it to me now and you know none of them are dopes uh -huh. so I guess I better take the line out so I took the line out and then that was it and then um, um, and then about a week ago this a woman called Meredith Haggerty um, who used to work at WNYC, um, suddenly tweeted that line. Uh, even though it says in huge letters in, in, in the galley, you know, this is not for review, this is not for quotation. She, you know, tweeted that line. And then suddenly there was this kind of ferocity of, oh my God, John Ronson thinks being fired is as bad as being raped. L you know, let's get him. But honestly, that's, I mean, uh, the whole thing was just mystifying to me. Like, but, you know... Um, firstly, because it's in a galley and it's not for quotation, and secondly, because t for the life of me, I can't see what's wrong with that line. I'm just, it's the same as saying, like, oh my God, Margaret Atwood thinks being laughed at is as bad as being killed. Let's get her. You know, that it was uh, my but, point but was Twitter, exactly the because same. this was tweeted out and it's tweeted out of context. So it wasn't even clear what the line was referring to. Yeah. But there was a lot of pushback. And I, mean, I have yeah, the Twitter loads. line, the Twitter feed here, and people were saying things like, the whole idea of this book is garbage. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, what if this is John Ronson's public shaming? Uh, mm. Somehow I feel better armed knowing how little empathy he can scrape up for women, sad but armed. 
Fuck I mean, this guy, fuck this guy, fuck this guy, I'll fuck this guy. Can you stop? <laughs> At this stage, I, I really get the point. I didn't read any of those. What I, a gibbering shit pile. But you, you, you responded. <laughs> you responded to this. Like you're, you're part uh, of this conversation. You went into the Twitter feed uh, and responded to these critics and reasoned with them. Yeah. Now, and then uh, fortunately... But I'm surprised you did that because uh, Justine Sacco said mm -hmm. one of, the, the, one of the, the, the things that she learned from her shaming was do not engage. Yeah. But you decided to engage. Why well, I thought... Well, I, 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 I've got to say, you know, all this was happening, by the way, while I was live on air uh, for, for Minnesota Public Radio. This was happening while I was live on air. And if anybody like, listens to that interview, I don't, I don't address it, but I sound so angry and upset. <laughs> So I've sort of answered our questions. And, you know, when you read those things out to me, I, I, I felt incredibly upset. Um, you know, that makes me feel really upset. Um, because, A, it's just horrible to be at the end of something like that. Uh, and, B, it seems completely unjust. Mm. Uh, and, C, I'm like, uh, you know, I'm a blank canvas at that moment for people to put their ideology onto. And the reason why all of that happened was because I've written a book that says, look, those of us... It, in the social justice movement. And, you know, I, I, for 30 years I've been writing social justice stories, stories from the left. Those of us in the social justice movement now have power. You know, we have power, and we are not using our power judiciously. We can't distinguish between a serious transgression and an unserious transgression. And given that we are the ones with the power now, uh, it is incumbent on us to make that decision because people are getting destroyed. Mm. Um, and the response to me saying what I believe is a completely reasonable, not only a reasonable thing, but a really important thing to say, is that. But isn't that part of what shaming is all about? If we look at what's happening, Justine Sacco was shamed because she was seen as a privileged person who didn't recognize the pain of Africans suffering from HIV. Yes. And Jonah Lehrer was shamed because he was seen as somebody who was extremely successful in journalism who then threw away the basic rules of journalism. Yes. And then you were shamed because you're seen as somebody who's writing about shame, telling us how we should deal with this phenomenon, and then you've done something that they perceive to have be a transgression itself. But you're mm. seen as somebody who is privileged, and yeah. that's the reason why. Yeah, because I'm a, I'm a white man. Um, well, you're a successful journalist. You're a writer with a voice. Yeah. Um, Yes. Well, I mean, there's there's a number of answers to, to that question. I mean, firstly, Justine was perceived exactly the way that you said it, but it wasn't true in Justine's case. Justine had 170 Twitter followers. People needed, for this to work, you know, because we can only destroy somebody now be, when they've misused privilege, you know, um, for it to work, we had to fictionalise Justine Sacco. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it spread all around the, win the, inter the internet that Justine's father was the billionaire diamond miner Desmond Sacco. Not true. Not true. Her father sold carpets. Um, she had 170 Twitter followers. She, she grew up in a single family in Long Island. Mm. Her mother was an air stewardess. Mm -hmm. um, Justine could only, I mean, unless I have a complete misunderstanding of the word privilege, you know, Justine could only be considered to be privileged if you half close your eyes at best. Mm. Um, Jonah yeah, it's a completely different kettle of fish. You know, Jonah absolutely deserved uh, to be fired. I would say when, when Jonah then tried to apologise um, at a journalist foundation lunch called the Knight Foundation, and they erected a giant screen Twitter feed behind Jonah's head, so anybody watching at home on the live stream could tweet what they thought about Jonah, you know, pleading for forgiveness. And so what we were tweeting, well, I say we, maybe it's none of us, what people were tweeting was um, Jonah Lehrer boring us into forgiving him. <laughs> Jonah Lehrer is just a frigging sociopath. You know, there's that demonising word again. Yeah. Um, Jonah Lehrer is proven that he is not capable of feeling shame. Like, how the fuck do you know that? This person sitting at home. Mm -hmm. You know, imagine if that was an actual, an actual court and the murderer is begging for their life mm. and we're all up there shouting, you know, sociopath, bored, bored. You know, imagine that. If we saw that in a courtroom drama, we would not think that was a good thing for, for the justice system to do. Yeah, that's exactly what we did. And then comes me, <laughs> Justine Sacco, Joe Dallaire, and me. This is where we are now. Um, and um, with me, um, I, think there's, I think there's a misunderstanding, actually. I think that... Um, I think that people thought I was writing about the Justine Sacco thing because I identified with Justine. Uh, I, I did identify with Justine, and I also identified with the people who tore Justine apart. Mm -hmm. You know, and I make that very clear in the book, and I think that, you know, the people who, who leapt on that I just can't have read the book. 
um, because all the things that they're accusing me of, um, if you read the book, you can see they're not true. But do you think that you can make a case that some people deserve to be publicly shamed? Is, is oh, sure. You, yeah. yeah, absolutely. The point is that we are not differentiating. We have the power now, and we're not differentiating between people who deserve it and people who don't. Mm -hmm. You know, Justin Sacker was being destroyed in exactly the same way as, you know, as, as a, a racist cop who killed somebody. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's no differentiation going on. That's the problem. Mm. Yeah, you know, I I have and continue to get involved. I, I was I was part of a shaming just last week. Um, the British Labour Party um, brought out this, you know, pandering to the xenophobes in Britain. They brought out this coffee mug that said "Vote Labour controls on immigration." You know, which is an absolute. Um, you know, throwing away so much of what you know we believe as Labour right. Party supporters. So I, I, I tweeted that, and and I said, look, you know, Christ, you know, how could I vote for Labour now? You know, so you know, this book is not against criticism, curiosity, journalism, citizen journalism, investigative journalism. You know, what this book is against is our propensity to disproportionately punish people who haven't done anything wrong. But you do say maybe the safest way to be on the Internet is to be as bland as possible. Yeah, and I say that obviously ironically. Like, you know, we've created, you know, social media gave a voice to voiceless people. Yeah. And that was its, you know, most amazing achievement. And now, you know, seven years later, this, you know, the smartest way to survive on social media is to go back to being voiceless. Uh let, let me ask you about, uh, many years ago, you made a joke about uh, Paul McCartney Christmas song being overplayed. Yes. And you wrote, Mark Chapman truly shot the wrong Beatle. Yeah. What happened, <laughs> what happened next? I got a, um, I got a um, letter from Linda McCartney uh, saying, so are you saying to me that my husband and father of my five children uh, should be killed by the man who shot his best friend? Uh, so I wrote back, you know, shit. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm really sorry. Uh, and it, and that was way. That must have been in the early 1990s. And that was definitely a moment that changed me as a journalist. And until that moment, I was heading in the direction of, uh, you know, Vic, I don't know. If people, he's not famous over here, but Victor Lewis Smith. P.J. O'Rourke, Huntress Thompson, you know, these kind of agent provocateur type writers. I couldn't think of another way of writing. I was only in my early 20s mm -hmm. and I'd just been given my own column in Time Out. Um, and so I was like channeling people that I liked. But when I got that letter from Linda McCartney, it, it was it really it sort of woke me up. But what's the difference between this very powerful person shaming you and the people on Twitter who sh tried to shame you this week? Well, I mean, there are differences. Um, one difference is that... I'd done something wrong <laughs> with the with the poor. I mean, it, well, it was. I mean, it wasn't. I mean, you know, it was. It was. She had every right to say that. To In me. the tradition of the edgy writers that you said you were trying to emulate, you did something right. Well, it was unempathetic. What I wrote, mm. it was unempathetic. You know, I, I forgot that they were human beings. I thought they lived in icon land. Um, it was unempathetic. Um, also, it came in the form of a private communication. Mm. It wasn't public grandstanding. Mm. Um, I mean, the only reason you know about it is because I, I have spoken about it yes. uh, on Reply All the other week. Um, um, so that's that's two things that make it different. Um, yeah, it was the fact that it was, I had done something that wasn't, uh, the, the, that line, you know, in, in the galley, even if, I mean, I think it wasn't right that she tweeted it because it was in a galley, which wasn't for uh, quotation. Um, you know, but even so, I don't regret the line. I don't. I don't see why I should regret the line because it was. It was not a line that was equating being fired to being raped. It was a line about how you know. It's a line about plausible fears and how different the plausible fears are um, when it comes to men and women. Hmm. Hmm. I don't see anything wrong with. That. I still can't see anything wrong with that line. What I said about Paul McCartney. Yeah. I mean, it's just a joke, but it was unempathetic. The line yeah, it's talking about murdering somebody. So. Yeah, oh yeah, God, I'm not defending myself yeah. for that. It wasn't good. Um, and she was right to do that to me. But the, the line in the galley was empathetic. It wasn't an unempathetic line. It was an empathetic line. You know, that, and that's a significant difference. Oh, thank you. Um, hi, hello. Hi, Chris, hello. Hey, John, how's it going? I'm um, doing my thank you. You're doing this, yeah. Um, <laughs> I was wondering, like, you've talked about having anxieties and uh, having, you know, being anxious as, as a writer. 
Mm-hmm. And yet you keep putting yourself in front of like neo-Nazis and the insane clown posse and just the scariest people. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like what, how do you actually like steal yourself to do that? And like, what is the, the benefit you get from that that you keep going? Um, I can't think of any real, well, um, well, one thing is that I think something about anxiety disorders, I don't know if anybody in the audience suffers from anxiety disorders, but quite often it manifests itself in irrational ways. So my anxiety, my personal anxiety disorder has always manifested itself in two ways. One is that if I can't get my son on the phone at two o'clock in the morning, I become you know, utterly convinced he's dead and will go through all the grieving process as if he was actually dead. Um, uh, and and the other one is that I've done something wrong in my work that could get me fired, which is why when I said to Joan Alera, what happened to you is my worst nightmare. And he said, yeah, and it was mine, too. Mm-hmm. You know, that wasn't a glib line. You mm-hmm. know, really, that speaks to the heart of it. You know, w- but my anxiety disorder doesn't manifest itself in a speaking in front of gr- rooms full of people. I'm f- totally fine with that. And be like hanging out with neo Nazis for some weird reason <laughs> that doesn't that doesn't bother me at all. Um, so I think maybe that's one answer is that uh, yeah, those things just don't make me anxious. I I am as an introvert weirdly I get really freaked out about meeting new people. Um, mm-hmm. And um, I remember one time actually I was doing a story for the Guardian about a guy. Um, who was arrested for trying to build an, uh, uh, trying to split the atom in his kitchen in Sweden, and I was on the train. <laughs> I was on the train on my way to meet him, and I suddenly had this like complete panic attack just about meeting a new person. And I, I got off the train, and uh, and then thought this is ridiculous, and I got back on the train again and went and interviewed him. By the time I was with him, it was like totally fine. Um, so I guess those are the those are the answers. And I, I think it was, you know, I I think it was Louis Theroux actually who said. Um, Someone asked him a a similar question, and he said, I'm less worried about what would happen to me when I was there, like, you know, at a Ku Klux Klan compound, than what would happen if I hadn't gone. Because what happens if you don't go is that you don't get the story. You you know, your career falls down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. About getting the story, uh, Justine Sacco and Lindsay Stone and Adria Richards, who we haven't talked about yet, and Joan O'Leary, all of them had never spoken to a journalist Mm. about what had happened to them before they spoke to you. Mm -hmm. What did you do to get those people to talk to you? I said, um, well, Jonah, I just kept hassling him until he finally thought, oh, fuck it, you know, get him off my back. Um, I mean, I said to all of them, you know, especially Justine and Lindsay, um, I think what happened to you is like terrible and historic, you know, really historic. you know, I, and I felt really passionate about telling their stories. Uh, Adria was much easier. I just asked her and she said yes. I think I emailed her twice and she said yes. With with Jonah, I, th- I think I said to him again, I absolutely meant it. I mean, none of this was like d- disingenuous. Um, I said, um, I, you know, I, 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 I want to live in a world where people get second chances, you know, no matter what they did. I, I want to live in a kind of redemptive a world of redemption where, and I want to remind people you know, that other people are human beings. You know, people were saying about Jonah, you know, he, he has not proven that he is capable of feeling shame. That's so convenient, you know? We we want to destroy somebody, but we don't want to feel bad about it. So we either think, oh, I'm sure they're fine, or we say, well, they're just sociopaths. Well, you people know? are also saying about Jonah, he still has the most powerful literary agent in the world, and he has two new books coming out in the next couple of years. So, so, so th- it's not as though th- th- people mm. believe that he's still in hell. Some people think he's still producing yeah. and that he's still able to produce uh, mm. in the future. Although when I met Jonah, he was in hell. I mean, he really was. He, he was absolutely crushed and broken. And that was probably a, you know, a year after it happened. Um, and you know, the jury's still out about whether his new books will win him any redemption or not mm-hmm. you know whether this is going to follow him around forever mm. but no that's what i said to jonah you know i want to live in a world where people get a second chance by the way but when i when i did do all of that stuff with jonah he he still had the most powerful literary agents in the world but he didn't have any book deals in, unless i've got the timeline wrong mm-hmm. you know i think he he had nothing at that moment mm. you know he was just walking around in the wilderness um 
you know, I say that it was kind of, I went hiking with him at Runny and Canyon, and I say in the book that it, you know, it seemed like appropriate, you know, sort of, a, you know, hiking with somebody in a kind of desert wilderness because it felt like a sort of casting out into the wilderness. But that analogy only went so far because biblical wildernesses don't tend to be filled with, you know, Matthew McConaughey walking his dog right in front of us. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jonah, the speech that you mentioned to the Knight Institute, uh, mm -hmm. this was supposed to be his redemption. Mm -hmm. And he allowed you to read that speech before he gave it. Yeah. And well, he, he asked me to read he it. He asked you to read it. Uh, and it, it, it's hard for me to tell what you thought of the speech. You seem to go back and forth in the book about whether it was a good speech or not a good speech. You say at one point it seemed to swim around in front of your face. Yeah. And then you watch him uh, online delivering the speech, which bombed terribly. Couldn't and and saw him be, be crucified in real time on Twitter at the yeah. same time. Why didn't you tell him that maybe he should rewrite the speech? Uh, honestly, I, 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 it was like his apology speech. He was attempting an apology speech um, unparalleled in the history of apology speeches, which was that he was trying to explain his flaws within the context of neuroscience. Um, <laughs> it was like a Joan Alera speech about how smart people like Joan Alera um, succumb to particular flaws. Um, so I was like reading a speech on the plane and I was thinking, well, it could be like the end of that Neil Diamond movie, The Jazz Singer, when the, like, the disgraced synagogue cantor wins over the congregation by reminding everybody how beautiful his singing voice is. Uh, or maybe it won't go down quite as well. But I didn't trust, <laughs> honestly, and honestly, I didn't trust my own, I didn't trust my own judgment. Um, I did not know. I've never, like, I'm, I'm a bit ADD-ish, I think. And, you know, the words, as, I, as you say, they were, like, swirling around the page. And I honestly didn't know. But I did write him an email offering a bunch of constructive criticisms, mm. um, every one of which he completely ignored. Um, <laughs> and then I did apologise to him and said that I think me telling him that I thought his speech was fantastic was maybe a bad steer. <laughs> you, you tell an anecdote about him in the book that he asks you not to tell in the book. He asks, he says, I would appreciate it if you leave this out. And then you, you justify yeah. putting it in. Do, do you feel that he regretted opening up to you the way that he did? Uh, I haven't heard from him since the book came out. And I should say that a huge amount of my conversations with Jonah uh, were off the record. And I kept them all off the record. There was one thing he said to me, I can't quite remember. What, I think it was, it was about, about having a conscience. Yeah, about, being, about whether he, or not he's a sociopath. Yeah. And yeah, he said if living in... He said, I, who the hell knows what a conscience is? Um... I wake up in the morning and the first thing I think every time, you know, as soon as I wake up are the things that I've done wrong, you know, if that's having a conscience and I've got a conscience. And then he said to me, but I'd rather you didn't use that. So I said, well, actually, I, I'd, I'd, I'd like to use that. And he says, well, I suppose it depends on the context. So I, I, so I did use that. But that's the only line that he didn't want me to use that I did use and I felt it's because, you know, I felt really strongly that like, you know, just sort of saying that Joan is a sociopath lets us off the hook mm -hmm. you know none of this is saying that what Jonah did wasn't wasn't wrong but I'm just I'm, I'm trying to humanize him and, and human and I'm very very proud actually of my chapters about Jonah and Michael um, Moynihan the man who exposed Jonah I'm really really proud of those, yeah. those chapters because it's it's I really bring to life like the agony of being found out you know I, and uh, you know I, it, I think you it really you know you really feel what it feels like to be Joan Alera mm -hmm. being found out in that moment. And, and as a writer, that's something I'm really, really proud of. I, I started off by asking you about what you were afraid of when you're writing this book. I mean, was there something, is there something, do you have a secret that you think could be found out? I mean, in some ways, a, a line that's been cut from the book is it kind of fits into that category, yeah, except although that you I, still stand by it. Yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, does that, honestly, can I just ask, like that line, now I've explained what I was trying to say in that line. Um, it was that I, um, I don't know if what Mercedes said was true because it was her yeah. point. Here, here it is, John. It's bolded here. Okay. Um, I, I don't know if what Mercedes said was right, but I do know this. I can't think of many worse things than being fired. And obviously, what? Obviously, maybe if I said as a man, I can't think of many worse things than being fired. But I am a man, so I just assumed. You know, I like to whittle sentences so, down. Do you, do you want to pull the room here? Do you, do you want to pull the room about whether... Yeah, I mean, now that it? I've completely explained it and put it in context <laughs> and so on. Um, and by the way, do remember that I cut, I cut the line out. The line isn't in the book. Because by the way, I listen to women. 
<laughs> right, but you did, you just defended the line, which I mean earlier in yeah. our conversation you defended. What's so. right before it again? It's Mercedes saying. Yeah, I um, I have that. It's Mercedes saying, basically saying. I mean to paraphrase Mercedes, she's basically saying we, as trolls, we degrade men because in our culture, the worst thing that you can think about doing to a man is getting them fired, whereas in our culture, the worst thing you can think about doing to a woman is is rape. Um, so I, you know, and then I say my line. So you're, you're responding, you're, you're mulling over what this person just, just told you. Yeah. And you're, you're, and you're, I basically say, yes, as a man, my most plausible fear, yeah. me, right. is getting fired. Right. So let's pull the room. How many people think, uh, John was wrong to have ever conceived of that line and put it down on paper in the first place? And please, I, I, I might've worded that too strongly. Uh, uh, I like, but, but I like this strong. <laughs> somebody said to me, like, like somebody said to me on Twitter, well, you should never have thought it. I, no, I, I think that that's that's the point. It was cut yeah. from the from the book, so yeah. uh, I think that that is the point. It is. It's it's bugging me because if you st if you still stand behind behind that line, I'm wondering whether you cut it out because you were afraid of being fired, so to speak, as fired mm -hmm. as somebody can be who's a, a writer. Um, or because you were afraid of being shamed. Like, would you rearrange that and say that the uh. worst thing that could happen to you as a man is to be shamed as a, a rapist or a misogynist? <laughs> um, well, no, I mean, no, the reason why I cut the line out is because three people who I respect, well, two people I respected and one person I didn't know but emailed me a really, you know, powerful email, um, all said I, that line could be misconstrued. So but I took what, it out. What would be the worst thing about it being misconstrued? Would it be that it would hurt somebody else, or would it be that it would hurt you? I guess. No, I, I guess as a writer, I just want to be. I want my my points to be clear. Mm. Yeah, um, yeah. So that's why I took it out. I mean, I could have, and in fact, if it wasn't so, you know, I, I, you know, I was traveling, and you know, so I was busy. You know, what what I could have done was was explain the line further, but then you know, I, I sort of thought, well, the line doesn't need to be in the book. So that's why I took it out. Yeah. So, so while you were, you, you realized that this had broken out on Twitter while you were doing a radio interview, yeah. did you feel like Jonah Lehrer making a speech while the Twitter uh, uh, condemnation was going on uh, simultaneously? On, I, felt, I felt furious. I felt like, they're, like I've written a completely responsible, empathetic book. That's, that all my book is trying to do is to remind people that we are dimensional human beings and to remind people that kindness and compassion and empathy is like the way forward. Um, and someone does that to me. Not just somebody, a whole bunch of somebody. Sorry? I was just gonna say not just one somebody, a whole bunch of somebody. Yeah, a whole bunch of people. I, I, thought, it was, I thought it was terrible. And I thought, shit, you know, I've been doing this work for 30 years. And the first time I get this kind of abuse is when I say, you know who the powerful crazy people are now? They're us. Uh, just one. I just have one question before uh, John. You you write in the book. You ask Twitter this question: mm -hmm. Is Twitter a kangaroo court? Yeah. Has Twitter become a kangaroo court? And somebody wrote back: Not a kangaroo court, John. Just commentary. Only unlike you, we're not being paid for it. See, they resent you. There are people who resent you for uh -huh. the fact that they perceive that you have a power that they don't have. The thing is, as I say, shamings these days only work if the person being shamed is of privilege. Um, and of course, it's a lot better to get somebody who's misusing privilege than it is to get somebody for committing adultery, which is the kind of thing we used to get people for back in the 19th century. Yeah, in um, the tabloids. Right, yeah, it, right up to the 70s and 80s. But, it, but there's still a problem, and the problem is we're using privilege as a catch-all for anybody we shame. You know, anybody, anybody shamed these days are getting labeled privileged, and that's how we justify the shaming. So, uh, have you ever thought about going back to doing documentary films? Um, I always felt a little awkward doing them. I, I, I don't know why, but I mean, I've made a couple that I'm really proud of. Stanley Kubrick's Boxes, I really love. Um, Secret Rulers of the World. I don't know, I always felt a little bit awkward doing them. I, I, um, uh, I love doing radio, and I might do a pod radio podcast documentary series next. I might do that. But... No, I, I I don't know. I always sort of felt maybe leave the documentaries to my pals, uh, Louis Through and Adam Curtis, mm. and I'll and I'll do the written versions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
uh, it, does that have anything to do with the kind of access that you get and the sort of spending time with people off the record and that kind of like, I mean, do you feel like your, your mm. style is more behind the scenes in that way or? Yeah. I like that. I don't have to perform like when I'm, when I'm um, with somebody just writing a book, you know, I don't have to worry about performing. I really like that. Also, I, I had a couple of bad documentary experiences. Um, one was when I, I did the documentary series that went with the Men Stay at Goats. And it was just really hard. Like I, I wrote the book. Usually my books take like three years to write. I wrote the book of the Men Stay at Goats in, in about eight months. Um, and the series was just a nightmare, you know, just practical stuff. We didn't have enough cutaways. And, mm -hmm. you know, people said things badly and all the things you can fix when you're writing a book or doing it as radio, I couldn't fix in the edit. And it was tearing me apart. And and the same thing happened with um, Jonathan King. Like, he was saying all this amazing stuff to me in the corridors of the Old Bailey, where he was on trial for, for paedophilia. He's like a TV personality. Um, and so as the written piece, it was like I could put it all in. But as a film, it was like you're piecing together the few little scraps, you know. And both of those things kind of just put me off, you know. I just thought, yeah. God, you know, I, I can tell my... Plus the fact that it's, you know, the gatekeepers are, are so much harder to convince in documentary. And I just, after all of that stuff, I just thought, oh, Christ, you know, I'll just, you know, I'll just do it for books from now on, or, or radio. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, yeah? Hi, Hi. I've just been uh, thinking a bit about uh, shunning in religious communities and the kind of thing that happens when people are shamed and actually sent away from the community physically or just never spoken to again, and the kind of thing that we're talking about, this kind of community online that defines itself in terms of who they get rid of mm -hmm. or put down or put away or whatever. But I'm also... My question is more about context. I mean, when you talk about things being taken out of context, what does context mean these days? I mean, you've written a whole book, and that's the context, but how many yeah. people are going to in, in, you know, go into that? Well, it's, I mean, it, it's shocking how we've eradicated context uh, on social media. But then again, we do it a lot in our type of media, too. Um, you know, we all, and, and in other industries, too, like you know, the pharmaceutical industry, I write about that in the psychopath test and, you know, the kind of bad, the bad aspects of psychiatry, you know, uh, the sort of furthest reaches and so on. You know, we, we, we over-label, we over-diagnose and we turn people. You know, Adam Curtis once said to me, as journalists, we travel around the world with our notepads in our hands and we wait for the gems. And the gems are always the outermost aspects of that person's personality. And like medieval tapestry makers, we stitch together the gems mm -hmm. and leave all the ordinary stuff on the floor. And the gems are always the things that would be defined within the DSM as mental disorders. <laughs> um, and Adam said to me, you know, we all know that what we do is odd, but we don't like to talk about it. Uh, and I quote all of that in the psychopath test. And and so, you know, the, the mistakes that we're making on social media are very similar to the mistakes that we make in, in the actual media, too. Um, but what I've found, you know, over the years is is that, you know, the older I get, the, the more careful I am to make my character studies you know nuanced which is what I did you know with in this book and you know as much as I possibly can and nine times out of ten the stories are better you know making the effort to make people dimensional and contradictory um you know and complicated actually makes the stories better not worse our, our instinct is is that this stuff will make things worse mm -hmm. um but actually it makes things better well Let's talk about Adria Richards a little bit because sure. Adria was the woman at the tech conference who overheard a joke mm -hmm. from two men behind her. Uh, it was a sexist joke. It was a stupid joke. And she turned around, took a photograph of them, and then put it up on social media condemning the joke. Uh, the uh -huh. fallout of that was one of these people who you identify in the book as Hank lost his job. Mm -hmm. But then things turned around and there was a push against Adria mm. for uh, invasion of privacy, mm. and she lost her job. Now, Hank was able to get another job in the tech industry. Adria so far has not been able to do that. Yeah, and, and in fact, in, Hank, in Hank's new job, I asked him um, uh, whether he's, you know, he's more careful around female developers now, and he said, well, there aren't any female developers <laughs> when right. working now. Right, and, and Adria is, I mean, you said that she was, uh, there, was a, there was a word that you use, y you said that it was an inappropriate shaming. Yeah. You use that word in the book, and you've been criticized for that, for saying that it was an inappropriate shaming. Yeah, but in the same way that all of us back then, and in fact now, uh, you know, we are all like toddlers crawling towards a gun with social media. Um, when we take somebody's photograph and shame them, 
really bad things could happen, you know, as happened with Hank and Adria. It was just carnage. Uh -huh. You know, everybody thought they were punching up, but it was just carnage. Uh -huh. You know, I point out in the book that Adria didn't call for, for Hank to be fired. Uh -huh. That's not what happened at all. And I don't think for a second she would have imagined that he would be fired. Uh -huh. So when I described Adria's shaming of Hank as inappropriate, it was just in the same inappropriate way that we are all inappropriate because uh -huh. we're with toddlers crawling towards a gun. What happened to Adria after that was, you know, nobody is in any doubt that it was like, you know, massively worse. The, uh, the, the impulse to do that, to shame somebody, uh, you know, Sam Biddle, who was the person that, that actually took Justine Sacco's tweet and made it go viral, he knew what he was doing when he did that. He knew what people would respond to in that tweet. He, and he said the tweet was a bad tweet and seeing it would make people feel, and seeing it would make people feel good and angry if we could only put one more wrong-headed head on a pike, humiliate one more bigoted sorority girl or ignorant Floridian, we could heal this world. <laughs> you, <laughs> Some you said, said that. Yeah. that. Now, do Shit. you understand? Now, now he's speaking in, in the context of regretting what he's done. Now. Ah, so, right. But do you understand? Although he said to me that you know, tweeting that thing was delicious. Delicious, right? Exactly. Yeah. Do you understand that impulse that people have when they want to join the pile on? when they want to stand next to the bonfire? Well, not anymore, because once you've visited the slaughterhouse, it's a lot harder to order the steak in the restaurant. <laughs> you reached out to Gian Gomeshi? Oh, I did, yeah. What, what did you want to know from Gian Gomeshi? You know, I, I, did, I was talking about this to Chris today. Um, I, I really hadn't, I, I didn't go any further. I actually didn't reach out to him. I, I emailed Chris and I said, you know, if I wanted to contact him, how would I do it? Um, and Chris gave, I can't remember, gave me somebody's email address or something. Um, but then I didn't go any further. I, I sort of thought it through a little bit and I thought the only, the only way this story would work, um, for me is if he admitted something, you know, if, if he confessed something. And then I thought, you know what, that's, that's just, that's never going to happen. I mean, I wasn't contacting him in the context of this book. Like, I think you've been, you know, unfairly shamed or anything. It was a completely different story. Um, because, you know, the people in my book, you know, with the, with the exception of Joan Alera, you know, I've deliberately put them in um, because I felt that their transgressions were minor. You know, what he is um, alleged to have done isn't minor. Uh, so I would never have put him in this book. But then I thought it through a bit and I thought, A, the chance of me getting him is zero. And B, even if I did get him, he's not going <laughs> to admit anything. So fuck it, I won't bother. So I never actually did reach out to him. But did you believe that you could understand what it was like to be him, un un given the circumstances of what was happening to him? Honestly, this was really a momentary thing. Like, I didn't, I just, I didn't even email him. Okay. No, I, I, I mean, you know, I would have liked to have talked to him and I would have liked for him to have told me some stuff that he hasn't told anybody else. Um, but that was as far as I got in my thought process. When you were talking to Max Mosley, how could you not the whole time you're talking to him be thinking Hitler was at your parents' wedding? I was really fond of Max. I like Max. Um, <laughs> um, you know, Max wasn't born when Hitler was at his parents' wedding. Did, did he? Did Max he, isn't a Nazi. Didn't he call you Don or something like that? He called me Ron. People Ron, always right? call me Ron. It's really <laughs> annoying. Yeah. Do we have any? Oh, we have more questions. Sorry, I, I didn't mean. To go ahead. Okay, Hi. I'll just wait. Um, I just wanted to ask a, a little bit about your podcasting experience. Um, I was wondering what that transition was like going from the written text um, mm -hmm. where you have so much control mm -hmm. over everything um, to that podcasting experience and what it was like to actually also transition from going from a production like This American Life where you're working with a whole bunch of other people who are packaging your material mm -hmm. to doing your own work. Um, um, I really, although I never did it by myself, I was working with two producers, Lucy Greenwell and Laura Parfit, who were like really brilliant. I mean, I mean, my experience is that it was incredibly time consuming and really badly paid, and I, and I loved it. But in the end, actually, B BBC w was funding it, and in in the end, I felt like one of those marathon dancers, and they shoot horses, <laughs> don't they? And I was kind of pleased when we were put out of our misery because you know every time they recommissioned it. It was like, I'm going to lose money because it's going to take us months to do something mm. and not get paid. But I am thinking now about doing a podcast series. Um, I, I, in fact, just this morning, I was rewriting the proposal. So, so I might do one now. I've, Did you I've feel 
did you feel good about the product at the end? Yeah, you're talking about John Ronson yeah, on, right? John Ronson. Yeah, 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 I love it. Um, one of the stories in John Ronson on um, kind of gave birth to the psychopath test. Um, so I'm, I'm really grateful. I'm incredibly grateful to Lucy Greenwell, who's just the best researcher I've ever worked with. Um, she's brilliant. Um, yeah, no, I loved it. Did, did you listen to it? And I did. I've listened to all of them. And did you like it? I like your voice a lot. Right. <laughs> you mean my, my lilt? No, it's. It, I, I like the way I, I like the way you question things. I like the way you bumble around stuff. Mm. I like I like this persona that you play, and I don't know how much of it is 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 you, and how much of mm. it is this persona that you've created, mm -hmm. where you are people's buddies and you're genuinely asking questions, and you're, yeah. you know, y y in a very unassuming way, get into very dark places. So I like that. Um, mm. I just I I think production value wise it's not it wasn't my favorite oh you, you know what though you would you would have heard it but you would have heard it like on my website right yeah and yeah. on bbc on the book bbc website as well. oh okay if you heard it on the bbc website then i have no defense yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna say like on my website it had been it was we kind of put up some kind of pirated copies on my website and i'm saying this as a fan i i love uh -huh. your work i just okay i just you know, it's, part, it, it's, it's probably partly my fault. The, the thing that Laura and Lucy used to get really annoyed with me about was how anal I was about every single word. Like I wanted, like I didn't want there to be any flim flam. It was like the opposite of Mark Maron. You know, I didn't right. want, I wanted it to be like really, everything was short and precise and, you know, in kind of miniature. And Laura and Lucy were like, you know, let it breathe, let it breathe. And I'm like, no, no, you know, I, I, I can't stand that there's a superfluous sentence. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we stopped doing the series, because we used to really fight over that. So let me ask you then, yeah. like, the fact that it was all so kind of in miniature and not breathing, was that something you didn't like about it or, or, or something? I think part of the reason why I sometimes listen to podcasts is whether it's, it's the real or not, is yeah. that feeling that it's a little bit more mm. fluid. In that case, you're definitely on Laura and Lucy's side. I'm a little side. bit on their side. Yeah. And, and I'm not saying that I want to go as far as the Mark Maron, like yeah. let, it, let, let the tape just go as we hang out. Yeah. Um, but Okay, oh, that's interesting. Well, that's definitely my fault. I mean, what you didn't like about it is definitely my fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's still a fan. Oh, so thank you. make more. <laughs> <laughs> well, I might, I might do this new series, actually. I really hope so. Awesome. Are you going to give us a clue of what it is? Uh, not what the subject matter is, but I really want to do it with Gimlet. Uh, yeah I mean I love them um, but I can't really say what it is yet but it's not dissimilar to my public shaming thing it's it's it feels like the next chapter on from that yeah. hi hi, hi. Uh, this is just a quick question I wanted to ask a while back but what is your approach with putting a tweet out into the world do you have a someone who looks it over and if so <laughs> who is that person right no I have no I have Never. nobody I've got like no <laughs> I've got like no assistant. I've got no manager. You I don't have a good friend that you'll send a particularly no. strange tweet to. No. 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 It's just me. <laughs> That's <laughs> yeah. It's no. It's li it's just me. Um, I've never thought I was very good on social media. Actually, yeah. I never thought I was. I don't know. I always. I'm, mm, I keep thinking I should get off Twitter. Actually, especially after what's happened the last couple of weeks. Mm. It, it's definitely lost its sheen. Well, they don't allow you to give context. No, but you know what? Like, if I went off Twitter now, everybody would be like, you know, yeah. they'd use it against me. Yeah. Right. So I can't get off it now. <laughs> yeah. Cool, thanks. Thank you. Hi, hey, Ian. Uh, so I heard about this from a friend of mine today. So uh -huh. on Facebook, Facebook was kind of going on fire. There was this vet in the States who... Um, oh, shot a cat. Yeah, shot cats. Right. So, yeah, and so there's, um, you know, a shot of her holding up the dead cat. Yeah. And so it's gone on fire, and uh, she's been fired, supposedly. And then the friend I was talking to said, I think this is a hoax. Ooh. So, so my question is, uh -huh. does it being a hoax make the shaming worse? Like, if like right. people just get outraged, and so they even get more outraged... Uh, actually, there was a guy, Elan Gale. Do people know mm -hmm, him? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he the did airplane. a hoax on a plane. Yeah, yeah, he pretended that this woman on the plane behind him was saying something offensive and, and writing nasty notes. And yeah. yeah, and he did this whole long hoax about shaming this woman on the plane, and everyone was like furious with him um, for shaming this. No, everyone was furious with her, and then people got furious with him, and then he said it was all a hoax, and I was like, meh. <laughs> um, yeah. So I don't know the answer to that. I, mm. um, I just I got sort of kind of annoyed that right. Elan had done that. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. So I, I talked to him about it. So. But uh, do you think it fires people up more? Do they all of a sudden, like, they see something, they get really outraged, and you know, they just want to, you know? Well, honestly, I haven't, I haven't thought that through. I don't know. Okay. Sorry. Can you get back to me on that? I will. <laughs> <laughs> Chris? Sorry. Um, BuzzFeed ran, uh, I think, three articles last week that were kind of critical of you. And then oh, you really? Fuck. I, are you sure? <laughs> Maybe it was only two. There was a review, and then there was I, a... I think one, came. there was one article in BuzzFeed which was really positive about me. Oh, maybe I read it in a different uh-huh. way. There was, there was definitely... Maybe you read it in a different yeah. way, Josh. I've got to say, you know, I'm, 40, I'm 47. I've been a professional journalist since I was 18. This, this has never happened to me so before. M- and I noticed that uh, the New York Times article, the review, was written by a guy who was a, used to be an editor at Gawker. Yeah. So do you... Mm. The New York Times reviewed the book twice, by the way, and the first time, Janet Maslin, it was a, it was a rave. Right. But I just have that on the record. But just... Uh, what mm-hmm. I'm wondering is if you think, maybe this is paranoid, but or do you think that there are people who have a vested interest in the public shaming In wanting industry, to keep shaming going. Yeah, who yeah, are, no who question. Are, have a hard time with your book. Yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, we are, as social media shamers, we are all like unpaid shaming interns for Google and Twitter and BuzzFeed and Gorka. You know, we are getting we're get, we we are we're getting nothing. They are making money. No question. And there's something ideological going on as well, I think. You know, the idea that you can't criticise social justice in any in any of its forms. You know, whereas I feel there's absolutely nothing wrong. You know, I'm a social justice person and I can't see why for a second I shouldn't criticise, you know, my people when we do something that's not right. I just don't, I don't get that at all. Um, that's what we're supposed to do as journalists. We're supposed to stand tall and not fear, you know, not fear frightening people. That's what we're supposed to do. I and mean, it's frightening to do it, but that's what we are supposed to do. Well, um, so, yeah, I think so. When you set out to write this book, John, did you imagine that you would have to defend it as vigorously as you're defending it now? No. Uh, Jeff Klosky, my editor, said to me around Christmas, like he said something like, you know, fasten your seatbelt. It's going to be a sort of riotous ride. And I'm like, what do you mean? And he said, there's going to be some people who hate this book. And I was like, "Why? <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's, it's what I'm. Why? I, I'm right." <laughs> <laughs> so he turned out to be right about that. Um, but, but can I just finish by saying, like, yeah. I, don't, I don't like the criticism of this book. It's like I know it's sort of fun to talk about, but still, it's got like on Amazon and Goodreads. It's still like you know, four out of five stars. <laughs> Nine, you know, ninety percent of the reviews of this book have been raves. You know, this is a very small amount of people who have been critical of the book. And, and when the Justine Sacco excerpt was put, printed in the New York Times magazine about two months ago, uh-huh. uh, it was electric. Yeah. And I think, I think that the discussion around it was very, very healthy mm. and probably extremely good for the book, as the book deserves. Yeah, I, well, I just, you know, I felt very passionately that I wanted to tell Justin Sacco's story. It still feels, even with this criticism I've had, it still feels like one of the most important stories I've ever told. John Ronson, thanks for being with us. Thank you.